Hi, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Lauren Epstein. I'm the host of the Lauren Epstein Show. And today we have a special guest. Uh, with me today is Howard J. Ross. Howard's a lifelong social justice advocate and he is considered one of the world's seminal thought leaders on identifying and addressing unconscious bias. Howard has delivered programs in 47 states and over 40 countries to audiences, including Fortune 500 companies, colleges, universities, and major institutions. So welcome, Howard. Thanks for being with us. Lauren, it's great to see you again. And so uh, there's some context for our interview because over the last few months, I haven't been doing a lot of new shows because of COVID. Uh, and COVID has stopped our conference participation because all the conferences, all the workplace conferences that we usually go to aren't happening. However, uh, there's two agendas. I have my own agenda, and then, and then you got some news. So um, for my audience who may not know, I started graduate school at George Mason University. I'm currently in the Organizational Development and Knowledge Management Program. And as part of our program, one of our first classes, we have to do a book critique. So, uh, you know, you and I, I mean, I, you know, we, we are connected on Facebook and I've interviewed you a couple of times. And then I found out that you just came out with your new book, Everyday Bias. So it's the second version of That's right. the original book, which I read completely. And as part of our master's program in this class, we have to do a book review. So I picked this book and my teacher was like, sure. So Killing Two Birds with One Stone, one, I wanted to highlight your work because hmm. the workshops that I do in part uh, have been influenced by your work, which thank you very much. Yeah. Really good well, stuff. Thank you. And thank I you. wanted to um, to get people to read this book. Uh, I think that there's no better time to read it. So we're going to talk about this book and what's going on in unconscious bias. And for those of you who are watching this on YouTube, I, I'll put a link uh, below that you can go get this on Amazon. I can't recommend it enough. It is absolutely amazing. And I'll tell you what it's not. It is not, uh, it's not an opportunity for you to feel guilty or bad. It's an opportunity for you to see something about you and your human brain for you to improve your life, become more aware and have more tools to be a more effective human being. Did I, did I capture that right, Howard? Did I? Thank you. I, pre I appreciate that very much. So that's Thanks. my experience. And, I and I just take, take you everywhere with me to say these things like this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's a great book. And, and, um, and I don't say that lightly. I mean, I don't, it, it's really, I, I read it over the last week and a half. I just finished it. And usually in our conversations and in most of the interviews, I don't have prepared questions, but today I have a ton of prepared questions because okay. I am critiquing Howard's book. So I, I wrote my critique question, plus I have a question from a 14-year-old kid from the UAE, uh -huh. who I think you'll, you'll be able to answer. So is there anything you want to say before we get started? Any kind of, any preface or what's going on? Well, I mean, I think just, you know, it's interesting, you know, as you know, Lauren, I started studying this, this whole field of unconscious bias. It's now just almost 20 years ago. And at the time I started studying it, there were very few people in the mainstream diversity space talking about it. It was mostly an academic um, exercise. Actually, it's now more like 25 years ago. And um, now it's become um, unconscious bias sort of became the shiny new penny in diversity work for, you know, for a while. And, um, and so, you know, everybody and their mother jumped into it. And I just, I, I think it's just important for us to recognize that like anything else, um, this is the kind of work that we have to have a deep understanding of in order to do it well. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, so I'm going to give you, I'm going to give my take and what I've been telling people is that I think now in our culture, in America, and it could possibly be the world, but I think in America, there's a break in our uh, cultural zeitgeist that whatever happened before, and I would say before um, George Floyd and before COVID is the past. And what's gonna happen in the future is still not clear. And we're in this moment where there's a, an openness to a new cultural paradigm. Yes. And I think uh, the work that I'm doing in unconscious bias, I think the work clearly you're doing in unconscious bias is so important right now. So, um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start off by asking you one of the questions in, in reading your book. Please. Um, and of course, you know, stop me and, and, and we can chat about it. So right. one of the things I noticed right away, did you know that your book does not use gender pronouns much? Well, I try to be, you know, I try to be gender neutral because, um, you know, first of all, I think that uh, one of the one of the forms of bias that occurs as a consistent, almost like the floor that we stand on in our culture is the language we use. 
and there, it's so often that we default to masculine language um, and, and because it's the normal, and, and this is in fact one of the key messages in the book that normalcy creates bias. And so if, if we get used to saying that, we say, hey, you guys, and things like this, we don't even realize the exclusive nature of that language. Now, I'm not one of these people who you know, thinks that this is a great crime and we've got to call on the political mm -hmm. correctness police, but right. I do think that we need to start being conscious. And of course, it's even more true now as we have more people who are gender fluid and who, especially younger generation of people who, who um, see themselves as they they, them rather than he, him, or, or, or her, or her. So um, I do think she, her. So we have to, um, I think, you know, it's important for us to recognize that and acknowledge it and continue to be open to changing. Yeah, one of the things you say in your book, I think there is a message is that it isn't the one thing that there is something that we need to address, but it's a multitude of little things. That's right. Um, and, and I think we see that in, in so many subtle ways. Uh, you know, it's fairly easy to deal with the most egregious forms of discrimination or bias. You see them, you see a David Duke or a Richard Spencer, you, you know what you're dealing with when you're dealing with f folks who are overtly racist or Harvey Weinstein being, you know, overtly misogynistic or, or sexist. You know, it's awful when you see things like that, but, but you know what you're dealing with pretty easily and you can launch into action to deal with that either through fight or flight. You know, you either challenge it or you back away from it. Um, what's really subtle are the unconscious ways um, that we have different experiences in life. And, and it shows up in, in ways that, that are really um, pretty invisible to some of us. For example, it's, um, you know, when we, when we see a, uh, you, know, a pe you know, I've got four sons and they've all passed driving age and I've never had to have a conversation with any of them when they got their driver's license uh, to be careful about how they acted with the police officer after they got stopped um, so that they didn't get killed. And yet every African-American friend I have who's had children of that age has that driving while black conversation with their kids. Now, I don't even know that, I might not even know that exists, that conversation. You know, no, I happen to because I do the work that I do and because I've got so many friends who are, who are black. But for many white people, it doesn't even occur for us that that's a privilege we have, that that's something we don't have to deal with. And these, these sort of layer upon layer, little, little things that occur, the subtle something the thing that somebody does the the eye contact that somebody does or doesn't make the amount of time or attention we give people um, the harshness that a police officer uses when they're speaking to a young black person versus when they're speaking to a young white person you know all of these things the layer over and over and some people call them microaggressions now i prefer the term micro inequities just because i think that the term aggression tends to be something we think about as conscious action. You know, somebody is aggressive towards somebody and most of these behaviors are unconscious, but they're, but they're layer upon layer of them in our lives. And for the most part, when we're not affected by them, we don't see them. And I think that's the beauty of, of the work and the position, I said the position, the context you're creating, which is that this exists. Everyone has unconscious bias because fundamentally we all have human brains that, you know, our amygdala and parts of our brains react this way. This isn't, and it's not a, it, and because it's unconscious, it's not willful. And if it's not willful, then we're not wrong. We're not bad people. Yeah. I think that's a really important message because a lot of folks, particularly a lot of my white friends, male friends, um, are resistant to this message because they think that there's an attachment to guilt or shame. Well, and I think that we have to take some responsibility for that because I think historically a lot of the work that we've done around diversity and inclusion and sometimes even more socially around civil rights, um, it, like was conditioned on the currency of guilt. It, it, you know, and in the early days, we really believed, I think, that if you made, you know, if you got people to see that they're being bad people and they should be better people, then that would change them. But, but the challenge is that we know now, and, you know, Brene Brown, of course, is a brilliant work around this. We know what guilt and shame does to us. It actually causes contraction we actually pull back. And so some of the ways we've done the work where we've laden people with guilt, um, and I, I want to be really clear, this is not, I'm not talking about taking care of people. I'm not talking about just so you don't make people feel bad. I'm talking about, you know, what makes a difference, because what I'm committed to doing is changing people's behavior. And if we engage in a behavior that causes people to contract rather than be more willing to talk about the subject, they're just not going to change as much. In fact, we know now looking at the brain science that when somebody thinks you're trying to fix them, it triggers activity in the dorsal posterior insula of the brain, which is the part of the brain associated with physical pain. So the things we're doing, and sometimes we feel good about um, because we're you know, speaking our truth and we're giving people what for actually causes them to do the exact opposite of what we want to do. Yeah, that's always been my experience. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump to the punchline 
you cite uh, the study that was done of uh, NBA referees. Yes. So I, I'll let you tell the story. Sure. Well, in, um, back, uh, it's been a few years now, but there's some researchers from uh, Cornell and University of Pennsylvania who studied, um, who studied the way referees in the NBA were making foul calls. And they looked at them, I think it was over a seven year period, looked at thousands and thousands of, you know, you know, hours of tape and, and studied how these calls are made. And what they found was that, um, that white referees tend to call more fouls on black players than they do on white players. Um, and uh, to some degree, black referees called more fouls on white players, but it was a far smaller differential. Um, and when they announced this, um, the NBA was you know, very defensive about it and said, well, this wasn't happening. They were going to launch their own study. We, uh, we never saw the result of that study. But, <laughs> uh, so I suspect what they found was, in fact, it was true. But the interesting thing about it, Lauren, was just the publicity that the study got and the awareness that it was happening began to change behavior. And when the researchers went back a few years later and conducted the exact same study, what they found was that the difference had, had diminished dr dramatically. So, so we know that while awareness isn't everything, it can be a huge force because if if you have people whose intention is and i think this is a good example i don't think very many referees wake up in the morning and say how can i you know get the black players today i don't, I don't think it happens that way i think what happens is you just tend to look at somebody as being more aggressive because of stereotypes you've seen you tend to think of them as being a little bit more frightening in their presence because of stereotypes you see so you when you see that same behavior occur with that player versus another player it just looks more like a foul but having had that brought to their attention their behavior Behavior started to change. So the first thing we need to do is to be willing to bring the stuff up to awareness so that we can see what's actually happening. Yeah, I can speak as, from my experience. There's been many times where I've done things that were harmful without intention, but once I was made aware of it, and I can say as a husband, it's happened thousands of times, you know, where I've, I've harmed my wife unintentionally, you know, and she is, does not waste a minute letting me know, you know, uh, that that's the case. All right, so I'm gonna ask you a question. Yeah. So there is a, a young man, uh, I'm gonna say 14 or 15. His name is uh, Akshat Sinha. And Akshat is a teenager from the United Arab Emirates. And he and I were talking uh, because he is, he's part of a, a group of teenagers that are doing really cool things around uh, the United Nations work. And he asked me the question, what is the difference between implicit bias and unconscious bias? I didn't have an answer. I said, I'll find out. So now I'm asking the expert. Yeah. Well, I mean, first of all, I think the, 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 yeah, I'm so excited to hear that there, you know, that there are people that age all over the world, you know, interested in this work. And, and I think that's, that's what's really hopeful more than anything else. But I think that, you know, one of the things is these, these terms are used so interchangeably at times that the distinction gets blurred. And so I can share what my distinction is. And that is that um, implicit bias is, um, is simply, uh, what happens with implicit bias is we see something and we implicitly or automatically associate that with another behavior. So, um, so you can see, for example, um, that you might implicitly assume that, um, that men are better at math than women, for example, because of the societal conditioning that we've had, because we've been taught so often that that's the case, because most of the people we see celebrated as mathematicians are men. Um, we've heard jokes about women and math and all this kind of stuff. So there's a sort of implicit automatic assumption. Now, that implicit assumption is sort of the, the bedrock, if you will, for unconscious biases. But implicit assumptions don't have to be unconscious. Sometimes we can consciously know that the implicit association is occurring. So, so, um, so unconscious bias simply means, you know, at a deeper level, we don't, we're not even aware this is happening. Now, most unconscious biases are implicit biases, but not all implicit biases are unconscious. Great. So I think uh, Akshat's going to be thankful for that. So I'll okay, call out so to him. Ahead. Ahead. So, um, so we're going to get into some of the technical aspects of your book. Okay. So I was a little unclear on how focalism works. And can you clarify that? Um, you talk about first impression, impressions and social priming, uh, which I had a little resistance to. Mm -hmm. So you had a little resistance to in what sense? Well, why don't you talk about focalism? Um, uh -huh. Yeah, talk about focalism. Well, how let it me works talk about focalism think... first, right? Yeah. Well, focalism, basically, the notion of focalism is, um, and it's very tied to anchoring biases. So, so what happens with focalism is, is we tend to 
get hooked by a particular thing. In other words, we will we'll look at the circumstance, look at a situation, but that but one thing or one set of things in that circumstance draws our focus and attention. So a lot of us um, have seen this happen. You know, for example, um, if a woman gets pregnant, all of a sudden she sees pregnant women everywhere. Or, or you, you buy a new car and it seems like everybody on the street has that car that you've, that you've bought. Or you're thinking of buying something and every time you turn around. Now, now it's interesting because Facebook now, of course, um, does this with algorithms, if you've noticed. Like the other day, I was looking, I'm looking for a rug for a room that we just had redone in our place. And, um, and so I'm looking for a round rug. And all of a sudden, advertisement. So I was looking on my, my browser. And all of a sudden, in my, on my Facebook feed, on the right-hand side there where the advertisements pop up, I see advertisements for round rugs pop up. Because face, Facebook actually reads my focalism as an, al as, a, um, as an algorithm. And so the tendency is to look that way. So, so how this can play out, though, in ways that can be really dangerous is let's say a police officer is with a large group of people and, um, and they have inherent biases uh, towards young black men um, being dangerous. Um, they will look at that group of people and the young black men in the group will jump out as the ones that they focus on looking for danger. And so I had a great example as I was working with the Justice Department um, doing some training, especially with the, uh, the uh, FDA, the Federal Drug Enforcement Administration. And one of the officers told me the story that they had gone to a mall because they were told that there was a drug dealer in the mall that a drug dealer was uh, Hispanic. Um, and they, you know, they're trying to get this person and they, you know, covered the exits and they watching behave, watching people's patterns and looking for a person. Um, the person walked right by them because the person was a woman and they were looking for inherently looking for a man. They just assumed it was a man, you know? So, um, you know, so, so focalism could be really blinding to us. It's, it's usually built on our back experience and a lot of times built on our stereotypes or built on the things that are really important to us. Um, it yeah. can be as much as you might look at it, If you're a stamp collector, you look at an envelope very differently than I do. You know, I, I will almost never glance at a stamp unless it something jumps out about it that grabs me. Um, now, on the other hand, if it's somebody who's really um, uh, important to me or really known to me, um, my Angelou stamp, I just got one the other day with my Angelou on it. And because so my focalism was towards my Angelou, all of a sudden the stamp was important. Um, so this is really important for us to recognize that we're drawn to certain things and not others, depending upon our life experience. Okay. All right. Um... So I just want to, I don't want to, I don't want to blow over first impressions and social priming, but I'm going to, I'm going to just pin it for a minute. Okay. So I want to ask you some a deeper questions. So what do you uh, think of the concept of reality and is the, and is, is reality empirical? <laughs> well, yeah. Light question. <laughs> the I told you it was going to be. I, that, that I, I, I said it was going to be a hard one. Thousand years, right? Yeah, right. Exactly. Um, well, I mean, I you know, I, I I'm reminded. Uh, I heard a um, I heard a, a, a quote years and years ago. It was attributed to uh, Joseph Searles, a great philosopher from University of California, who, who's you know a philosopher of consciousness. And and the story supposedly went, whether he said it or not, I don't know if it's apocryphal. He said, um, you know. When we look at things that we consider reality, when we pull back the surface, what we realize is that they're interpretation. And if we pull back the surface more, we'll get more interpretation, more interpretation. But finally, if we get to the core, when we finally get to the core, what we realize it's interpretation. Um, so there is that sort of um, existential way of looking at it, which is that reality is only what we say it is. As the said more colloquially, Lily Tomlin once said, reality is a collective hunch. You know, um, I, I guess simplified because I think we do know that there's some hard reality you know you fall to the ground and the ground's there it's real it, it hits you you know I'm sitting in this chair this chair is real it occupies time and space in that sense it's real however the interpretation chair is not necessarily real because if I were to take the same piece of furniture and go out to the Kalahari desert and give it to people it wouldn't occur to them as chair necessarily it might be weird uh, strange weapon we have here or a strange um you know ceremonial headdress or or you know a shield or you know what or maybe you know a chair whatever but the point is that it's um it's the interpretation of the physical object um that that changes and and if you think about it um the interpretation is more what we consider reality than the physical object itself so when we relate to this physical object, we relate to it as chair. We don't relate to it as physical object, which I'm interpreting to be chair. And so 
So I think there's a certain fluidity to this. The sun does come up in the morning. Um, you know, the trees are this color we call green. Um, and, and there is a physical reality, but that experience, uh, what we mostly think about um, in terms of our reality is much more interpretation than it is real. And I think this is one of the problems that we have often, especially during conflict, we see this so much now in our political system, which is um, we, we begin to think that our interpretations are real. Um, and, and then we get self-righteous about them. Yeah, I, I, I agree with everything you said. And my interpretation of reality is that, like when you talk about the chair or the ground, that we now have science to say that the chair, while it feels solid, is fundamentally not solid. That's right. That's so I, I look at the quantum level. <laughs> yeah, at a quantum level, it's not solid. That's you right. can pass things through it. And so my interpretation of reality is that our brains have a way of creating this frame called reality so that we don't go crazy and that we can exist in the world, right? right. Because we can't constantly be uh, pondering the nature of everything that occurs as, is this real or not? And I yeah, think and what, we can what, see that, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I think you can see this plays out in these circumstances that, that are so horrific that we watch every day. You know, I mean, when, um, when George Zimmerman was on trial um, for killing Trayvon Martin, for example, um, the whole thing hinged on whether, according to stand, their, stand your ground laws, he was actually being threatened. Now, was he really being threatened? Um, you know, I would argue that Trayvon Martin was walking down the street. He didn't ask to engage with George Zimmerman. George Zimmerman followed him. So the threat was more on the part of Trayvon Martin than, than I think realistically than the threat of George Zimmerman. On a broader scale, we know this. We know that one of the great myths of American culture is this fear of black men raping white women. You know, we know that this has carried on for years and years, and it was really triggered by the birth of a nation in 1915 and, and all that came with that. But the reality is, if we look at American history, black women have far more often been raped by white men than, than the reverse. So, so you know, the, so our interpretation um, that becomes our reality leads to behavior that can be dangerous and, and sometimes can even create a self-fulfilling prophecy. Right, and then bringing in the cultural zeitgeist and the narrative and yep. who controls the narrative. And that's another thing I wanted to talk about because um, the one thing I think most people don't fully embrace is that there's a, there's a majority minority in our country and everywhere, right? And in lots of different buckets, mm -hmm. right? And those majorities actually uh, don't always know what's going on for the minority. Their paradigm is not influenced or affected by the minority. So, you know, for example, um, you know, men are in charge of our country, right? They've been in charge of our country since the beginning, not women. So they don't have a sense or a frame of reference for what it's like to be a woman. And they don't, they can't. And so in not having that frame, because they're the majority, the majority rule, the majority uh, narrative is framed through the eyes of male not i'm gonna i'm not gonna put a judgment on it because i'm not saying it's good or bad right. for the for, but but that is what's so and if we can see it as that's what's so then we can see all the different places where that occurs so for you know we know that lgbtq folks are a minority by the population so the majority is not going to understand that frame people who are hand uh, who, uh, uh, people who don't have arms or legs or who don't speak well are a minority and we don't have that frame. I was moved and I, you know, I'm just moved by people who, who, who do have those uh, minority challenges and when they share, it blows me away. And I'll give you an example. A number of years ago, I had a colleague who I knew was a man. Years later, we worked together and she presented herself as a woman. And I, I had no, I didn't really care. I'm, I'm very, I don't have a bias around that. But one night she came after work, like we were, I was in my office and she said to me, she explained to me that the reason she changed her physical gender was because she contemplated killing herself. And this was the only way she could see to continue to exist as a human being. And I had never heard that. And it really left an impact as you can tell, I'm still sharing about it. And, and it made me think like, while I accept whatever she presents, I don't fully understand what's going on for her. I have, I really don't. 
And I think yeah. that that is the opportunity. Like the inquisitive person, the knowledgeable person, the interested, the curious person now in within us can be called forth to say, well, what's going on? Like, not that there's something wrong, but what's, what else is going on? What could I explore about my colleagues, my friends, other people that are sharing the planet with me that are both incredibly valuable, incredibly useful, and that we all need to get along in order to have a, a, great, a great country and a great world. So um, anyway, I, yeah, I think I went on yeah, a, think, a screen. No, there, that's but. okay. But I think, I think this is really important. And I, I, I choose to use slightly different language. I refer to it as dominant and non-dominant versus majority and minority, because I think majority and minority sometimes make it seem numerical, and it doesn't have to be numerical. So for example, in South yeah. Africa, the dominant group during apartheid was white, but it was sure. not a majority. Right. You know? Yeah. So, but but the importance of this is, is dominance represents um, usually the cultural norm, and that is normalcy plays a huge role in it. And normalcy is a huge impact on human behavior. You know what we consider normal. I mean, you think about all the things that happened throughout history. Um, you know, it was normal at some point for German folks to to turn in their Jewish neighbors um, to the Nazis because that's what we did around here. You know, it was normal for people to send typhoid lace blankets out to Native American communities to quote control the population or slavery was normal in this society for a lot of people. We look at some of these things historically as incredible aberrations or incredibly horrible things, um, but we don't even realize that for people who were living in those cultures while they were happening, they became the norm. And I think similarly what you're talking about, that, you know, I was just talking to somebody yesterday about this. Um, I was doing another interview and the interviewer was asking me, and was, was said, well, this kind of feels like it's been like for me be left-handed, she said, you know, because she says she remembers going to school and the scissors never worked for her because, you know, she was left-handed. I remember my dad was left-handed, used to talk about this. She said the desk was, all, the writing desk was always on the wrong side for her. And she remembered being teased about that. And, and I remember a number of years ago, uh, many years ago now, doing a workshop where people were sharing some of their stories as children. And this woman shared that she was left-handed and she was in school. They tried to make her right-handed and she got bad grades and penmanship and she had, and she starts to cry. She's like a 50 some year old woman because the wound was that deep that she was a straight A student and she would come home with these B minuses in penmanship because she couldn't quite write clear enough with her wrong hand to do that. And, um, and, so, and so that's a kind of good way for us to look at it is like, are we, you know, is it normal for us? Is it normal for people to have to talk to their children to prepare them to be with a police officer, for example? Well, it's not if you're a white person in this society but it is if you're a black person. And, yeah. um, and, since, and since, as you said, those of us who are white make the racial rules or set the racial zeitgeist in our country, um, that can sometimes be lost in translation. We don't even realize a lot of the things that other people have to deal with in order to survive. Yeah, I, I have to say, I, I had a, a, a resistance to the idea of um, white privilege when I first heard the concept. And I do because I feel like my life has been like numerous struggles. Mm -hmm. And I can point to specific things where I can say, I didn't have this and other people did. Like I didn't grow up in a household with two parents mm -hmm. and you know, I didn't have you know, money to do other things. And I was harassed by the police and I was mugged you know, in high school. Sure. And, you know, and I can point to all these things. And then what really kind of shifted my mindset, which is really just the last couple of years is, is the idea that like you're saying, no one ever talked to me about, hey, if you get pulled over the, by the police, you have to act a certain way. And I've never had the police draw a gun on me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've never been, uh, a, you know, like arrested, handcuffed and, you know, thrown in jail. Um, I've never been followed in a store. And, and I can tell, and I always think it's like me, but I get now that it's like my, my whiteness. Like when I go into a store and I say, I'll give you an example. I bought a pair of boots at REI years ago. And I left the store, I used them, they were horrible. I went to return them and REI said, oh, well, we had made a mistake. You never paid for these. And I didn't believe them. So I took the boots with me, I went home, I checked it out and then I returned them. I am sure that they left me, let me leave in part because I was white, mm -hmm. right? Well, yeah, I, th yeah, I think there are a couple of things about this. Um, I'm sorry, were you not finished yet? Well, no, I just, I, I just feel like now I can see that while I don't have all the privileges of like other people, I have had certain privileges and because of the color of my skin and because of my gender, it doesn't mean my life has been, you know, perfect or somehow graced by 
all of the blessings that America can offer, but it's not been the same as uh, what a woman would experience or someone who's homosexual would experience and all these other things. Yeah, I think, I think there are a couple of things about this, Lauren, that we have to understand. First is um, that when we talk about white privilege, I mean, I think, first of all, when I say when we talk about white privilege, people use language in all kinds of ways, and some people use it appropriately and some people inappropriately. But my, my belief is um, that when we talk about white privilege, we're talking about a systemic phenomenon that impacts us personally, but it's a systemic phenomenon. It's a little bit like rainstorm. We had a rainstorm out here just about an hour ago. It was not a personal rainstorm, but if I was out there, I would have got personally wet in it. You know what I mean? It doesn't make it a personal rainstorm. So I think, first of all, we need to think about white privilege as a systemic phenomenon, and that is, it's an, an issue that affects groups of people. So it means if we look at groups of white people, we would say that groups of white people generally experience different kinds of behavior than groups of black people do. And we have, you know, more data than we could possibly produce in weeks um, that, that shows that, that whether it's the way people are treated by police officers or economic treatment or access to health care or, you know, any number of these other kinds of things. <clears throat> Excuse me. But that doesn't mean that an individual person may not have the kind of struggles you're talking about. White people grow up poor, they grow up in abusive environments, they, they have all those kinds of circumstances. However, the other piece of this is that were two people to grow up in that same environment or that same circumstance, would they likely be treated the same? So you said you were arrested or har harassed by the police. I forget how you, you characterized it. Harassed, not point. arrested, but harassed. Yeah. I mean, okay. I've been pulled over so, by the police where they've yelled and been in Exactly, people. and they yelled at you, yeah. but they probably didn't beat you or they may not have beaten you or maybe they were not quite as rough with you as they might have been with somebody who was a, a, a black man of your age. Yeah. Um, maybe you wouldn't have seen to be quite so much of a threat. Maybe the language they used would have been different. And, and of course, we don't know that because as you said before, we don't see it. We don't see the way other people are treated. We see the way we're treated. And so I think that there, there are two parts to this. One is that we have to recognize um, that if we start to look, we will see these, these kinds of things that happen. You know, I know I began to notice years ago when I started doing this work, you know, times when I walk up to a countertop a moment after an African-American woman and the person turns around and asks me first what I'd like. Um, you know, that sort of a thing that happens. I walk into a restaurant, people just assume as a six foot five white man um, that I'm the leader of the group, even if I may not be the leader of the group. So you know, this happens This happens in all kinds of different ways, yeah. um, some, some subtle and some, some pretty innocuous and some sure. not so subtle and incredibly dangerous. Yeah, when I was, so I lived with my mom, single mom, and often when workers would come to the house, they would talk to me as a kid and not my mom. Right. We, and then like we'd go out to dinner and I would be given the check as a young man versus my mom. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and, and that was just kind of weird. And I think she and didn't not like it at all. Yeah. And even that circumstance, you know, I was a single father for 11 years. And, and I had a lot of friends who were single parents, most of whom were women during that time. Um, you know, I got to know them through, the, I, was, I was running a school at the time, so I got to know them through that. We would hang out together socially. And it became fascinating to me, for example, how much easier it was to be a single father than it was to be a single mother. Because people were incredibly sympathetic <laughs> the single fathers, you know, oh, you poor thing, you've got to take on this burden of raising your child by yourself. But for the single mothers, it was like, that's the way it's supposed to be. So, um, so I would have people, you know, tell me, oh, if you need any help, let me know. I never, I'm getting friends to babysit for my son and, you know, all this kind of stuff, which I know my single, my single female friends would sometimes struggle with these same things. That when I was dating, it was seen as something that was a positive because I was somehow more available because I was a single father raising my son. Whereas single mothers who I knew, sometimes it was like, well, guys didn't want to take on somebody else's baggage, you know? So, so even in, even in some of these challenging circumstances, the way we relate to them could be quite different depending upon, in this case, gender, but it could also be other distinctions like race or sexual orientation or the like. So I, can I give you some critique on the book? Sure, of course. Yeah, okay, so thank you. So a couple of things, there's two things. One, um, you use the frame zero tolerance and it was zero tolerance for certain behaviors. Mm -hmm. And I have come to feel like zero tolerance is a bias. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to just kind of check you on that and what you thought about that. When you say you think it's a bias, what do you mean by that? So um, there'll be something like zero, we have zero tolerance for uh, a behavior at work, uh -huh. right? Yes. And someone says we have zero tolerance. And then that behavior is, is expressed mm -hmm. 
Well, clearly there wasn't zero tolerance. It happened, right? Mm -hmm. And so when people say zero tolerance, what I think it means and what I've seen it applied as is that you're fired. Yeah, it can mean that. I mean, it, it, or it could mean, you know, you, this is something we're going to act on, we're going to discipline people on, and we're going to intervene on, um, you know, it may not take it to the point of firing, but let's say, for example. But it's implied, the word zero yeah. tolerance, it definitely implies that there's like, this is the end. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, well, I, I could hear, I, I could see, I may hear it that way. From from my standpoint, what it means is that there's certain there's certain behaviors that are acceptable, and there's certain behaviors that are unacceptable, and there's certain behaviors that, you know, we don't like, but we're not going to really do anything about it. If somebody uses somewhat salty language, for example, we may not like it. We may say, you know, hey, can you ratchet it back a little bit? You know, you might offend people, but but we don't feel necessarily like we're going to come in and say stop using that language, right? Um, if somebody uses the N word, however, we're going to say no. That, that language we have zero tolerance for. We, we, we are not going to tolerate that language. We're not going to allow that language to occur in our environment. Um, that doesn't mean I'll fire you the first time you use it, although in the case of the N-word, you know, it's so obvious that, that we might, but we could choose, say, another word that, let's say, the, the B-word, if I call a woman the B-word. You know, um, somebody might say, well, um, you know, don't do that again. You know, you get one warning, you're not going to do, you don't do that again. We're not going to tolerate that language here. We have zero tolerance for that kind of language. Um, I, so I, so for me, it, it's not necessarily, doesn't mean we're going to, you know, fire somebody or kill them, but it means that, that we're going to make it really clear that there's a line that's drawn and certain behavior past that line is not acceptable. Now, how much flexibility an organization has relative to allowing somebody second chances, there's another question. And sometimes that has to do with um, some, how egregious something is. So let's say, you know, where sexual um, harassment is concerned, um, you know, one of the things that happened during the Me Too movement is that a whole lot of different behavior got thrown into one bucket. So we, you know, you'd look at the pictures and I think it was Time Magazine had pictures of all the people who were accused and, you know, all these basic mug shots of men who were accused of this behavior. And in the same page, you had Harvey Weinstein and Garrison Keillor. Um, and, and their behavior was very, very different. I'm not saying right. that what Garrison Keillor did was okay. I mean, I don't really know. I wasn't there. I don't know. But nobody accused him of doing anything like Harvey Weinstein did, which was basically raping people and quid pro quo. Well, he committed a crime. And he committed, committed a crimes, felony. Yeah. And all that stuff, you know. Yeah. And to put him on the same page and act like all of this behavior is the same um, is, is somewhat problematic because, you know, we might say that what Garrison Keillor did is something that's um, that's redeemable. That is, if he understands that putting his hand on somebody's back in, in, in the way that he did or, you know, making some kind of physical contact on their, somebody's shoulders or th that right. kind of behavior may be uncomfortable and inappropriate for people. Um, but it's very different than quid pro quo sexual harassment or sure. rape or, or any of these aggressive kinds of things. And so on one hand, we might say this is something that's trainable. And this is one is something we have zero tolerance for. We're not going to we're not going to even allow that. So I'm going to invite you to to reframe the zero tolerance as measured tolerance. Okay, I can accept that. That we can be now. I have to rewrite the damn book. Is that what you're saying? Pretty much. <laughs> well, version four or five. It's, it's right, like exactly. I'm looking for it. I mean, there's yeah. a couple other things that I would critique, but you know, like on page eighty, you framed uh, you framed a graph around reconciling the dissonance between the community of our shared experience mm -hmm. with lacking privilege and the difference between the effects of certain privileges over others. So you have status and power on, on the Y axis mm -hmm. and resources on the X, but you didn't have a graph. Mm -hmm. And I was hoping for a graph because it was really a good, I think it was actually important to land that. And I would say a graph would really have made it a little more uh, concrete because it was a little, Hard to follow just in the language, but that was my yeah. That 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 makes sense. Thanks, I appreciate that. Yeah, that's a, a I think a, a fair critique. Yeah, I mean, um, I think that the main point the main point in this that people don't often get is um, you know beyond beyond what you're saying about the graph, which I think you're which is makes a lot of sense, is that um, sometimes we look at people, particularly true in people in non-dominant groups. So so let's say we we see a woman who's in the C-suite, and she's got a high salary. Um, she's vice president of human resources. Let's say. Um, in, in a predominantly male-led organization. Um, and people say, well, how can you, you know, say that she's, you know, there's any um, sexual uh, or, or, excuse me, gender discrimination here. You know, she's making, you know, whatever amount of money she's making, she's got a C-suite title and the like. But then you look at the way her influence actually plays out. 
and you realize she's actually not seen as a full partner in the C-suite. She's, she's sort of a bystander in the C-suite. A lot of people who are chief diversity officers are treated this way. Yeah. Um, and, so, um, and so the actual power and influence they have is much less than their title, their status and financial situation. Um, but it's really hard for people to get the complaint because you know, you're making you know, $300,000 a year and you got this sweet seat and the big title and the big office and all that stuff. What are you complaining about? And, and this, is, this is one of the real challenges that we have, um, particularly when people in non-dominant groups um, achieve some kind of stature. I mean, I had this happen a, re a number of years ago. I was um, interviewing a guy who was a senior, um, a senior officer in a company here in the Washington DC area, African-American man, making over half a million dollars a year, lived in the Kenwood community, which you may be familiar with. It's a high income, mostly white community. Yeah, you, you cite his story in the book. Yeah, the P Potomac area, and 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 one day he's telling me with it in his office, you know, the door closed, in tears, how his son had come home from college that summer from Princeton, I think it was, was home for ten weeks and was stopped four times coming in and out of his own home neighborhood, um, you know, his only crime being a young black man driving an expensive car going through a predominantly white neighborhood, and and he and in tears, this guy who was successful, you know. Big salary, big job, big house, nice neighborhood, nice car, the whole bit. You know. In tears is telling me he's terrified that his son is going to lose patience the next time and get angry with the police officers, and then God only knows what will happen. So, so I think that you know that this is one of the things that's really challenging is that people don't understand that that your level of success doesn't doesn't necessarily uh, mitigate the way you're treated in this regard. And there's a wonderful book written a number of years ago by Ellis Coase, a uh, New York Times writer called The Rage of the Privileged Class, which talks about this, about you, know, you get to that point where you think you've achieved the American dream and still you're just another black guy to a lot of people. Yeah. Well, um, I have enjoyed this conversation. I mean, oh, I think we could go on. I'm gonna, yes. I'm gonna plug your book again. So oh, if you are you so into much. this, buy this book. It really is a good book. And I, I, I dog-eared and, and highlighted it. And I'm gonna, so my, uh, my book review, I'm gonna submit it to Amazon as my review of your book, uh, because it ha it'll have some critique in it as well. And right. my, my personal experience of the book. Um, is there anything else you wanna share before we, we wrap up? No, I think, I, yeah, I mean, I think the one thing I would share is that I think we're at a time right now where we have to be particularly sensitive to these issues. You know, we have a great example of it these two weeks. You know, last week we were watching the Democratic Convention. This week is the Republican Convention. And most people in the country are not watching these conventions to listen. They're watching these con conventions to get affirmation and to poke holes in the other side, whichever side we're on. And, and it's understandable, especially given the polarization we have and giving how, given how dramatic um, that is right now. Um, but it's a great example of how we can get um, trained by our own patterns of, um, of bias. I was just thinking, I didn't really ask for a whole lot of the solutions that you provided because you have a whole section on solutions. So it would be remiss to stop here. So I'm going to ask you to just kind of highlight because you're right. How do I, how do we kind of puncture those, those cultural bubbles that we live in? And how do we mitigate our bias? So why don't you speak what? to that for a bit? Because I think that, sure. yeah, that's, that's the, it's the money. Sure, I th yeah, of course. I think one of the things is we have to start um, uh, creating more question marks and less exclamation points. I think that if we begin to realize, as we talked about before, that most of our attitudes are interpretation. Um, it doesn't mean they're wrong. It doesn't mean it's bad for, for things to be interpreted. Um, but we just should see interpretations as interpretations. Um, you know, it's, uh, and I think what, what we do is we see our interpretations as truth or fact, with, uh, you know, with a capital F, you know. Um, I think that, um, so one thing is to recognize that we all have biases and we all do this in terms of our interpretations and to be willing to question them and say, do I really have credibility for this particular point of view I've got? Second, um, in order to do that, to learn to watch ourselves more, to look for patterns in our behavior. Uh, are we seeing people, um, for example, if you look at your best friends, your, your, your inner circle, your group of 10, the 10 families that you're the closest to, you know, what do they look like? Um, you know, do they represent any diversity or are you surrounded by people who are only similar to you? That doesn't mean you're a bad person, but it may be you want to expand your life a little bit. Um, the, 
I think the third thing is, and this is, we do get into in, in the appendix of the book, there's 17 pages of ways that we can look at structures and systems and recognize that certain structures and systems are more prone to bias than others. So something as simple, for example, as a, when you're doing an interview, if you're a person, you're hiring somebody, when you're doing an interview, giving people the interview questions a few days early so that introverts uh, don't necessarily show up as slower than extroverts in the interview because we have right. such a, a cultural bias towards introversion or women or people from other cultures who are taught to be a little bit more introverted in their affect um, because of their cultural norms won't show up as less than in a culture that really favors extroversion. So we can go through, you know, as I said, there's 17 pages there of at least 10 different aspects of the um, talent management cycle. We can look at different ways that we can recruit people better. We can make better hiring decisions. We can make better job assignments. We can do, you know, we can put systems in place that call us to mitigate our bias more. So the important thing is we recognize that if we realize we all have bias, rather than giving a sense of hopelessness, it now gives us an opportunity to take responsibility for that and do something about it. Yeah, in the workshops that I do, I've created a workshop on scorecard interviewing, which I've used for a long time. And scorecard yeah. interviewing really mitigates a lot of that interpretation when you can all agree upon what a score of one, two, three, or four, or five is. And then also um, experiential interviewing where people demonstrate the thing that it is that you're hiring them for uh, yeah. so that there's less, less bias. Um, and also breathing, simple things like breathing, right? So we, we yes. know that, you know, when your amygdala gets activated, you know, you, the energy, the amount of energy and focus going to your prefrontal cortex is cut off, right? Exactly and right. just by doing some slow breathing and even, or muscle contractions, you then yep. activate your prefrontal cortex. Very yep. biological stuff Absolutely. to, you know, cancel, you know, stop that amygdala hijack. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's, it's easy. That's exactly right. But I, and I think that, that the, the operative word there is slow, you know, to slow ourselves down a little bit. And that's challenging in our culture because our culture rewards speed sometimes yeah. over accuracy. We yeah. like things to happen fast in our culture. And, uh, and we also like to have the answer. You know, I remember the first time I was in India, I, I uh, inter was interacting with somebody and, and she says to me, I'm not going to, you know, offend anybody by trying my Indian accent. But uh, she says to me, um, yeah, we have, a, we have a joke that we tell about Americans, but Americans don't get the punchline. And I said, well, what's the joke? She says, what do you get when you ask an American a question? And Oak said, okay, what's the punchline? She says, the answer. You see, in, in, in Eastern cultures, particularly, people realize that wisdom comes with sitting with the question for a while, contemplation, um, thinking about what are the different aspects of this or what are the thoughts. But we are so rushed to answer questions in our culture and get to the next thing that sometimes we don't consider some of the other alternatives. So I think slowing ourselves down, giving our slow brain a chance to kick in a little bit, the prefrontal cortex you talked about is enormously helpful. And of course, people like Daniel Kahneman have looked at this not only in the context of diversity, but in the context of behavioral economics and investment strategies and all of these kinds of things. And we know that in fact, it, it is um, endemic to how the human mind works. And this is um, and this is something that people can practice and get better at. It's not Absolutely. binary, and it's not like it'll just continue to affect you. The more you practice at these things, the better you'll get. And if the better you get, the more expansive you can be. The richer your life will be. The better the better choices you'll make. Because Absolutely. we're biased about like you you know about how quickly we buy things. I mean you know I bought things that I'm like what the hell did I do that for. Right. Impulses. Right. And of course, and of course, it's, it's even built into our culture. You, know, you think about it, what have we heard? We heard, you know, count to 10 if you're angry. You know, we heard that from the time most of us were little. Well, it turns out that there's solid brain science about this because the amygdala trigger, what, what yeah. sometimes Daniel Goldman calls the amygdala hijack that you were referring to earlier, it actually lasts only for about 90 seconds. And so after 90 seconds, the brain will start to slow itself down. The amygdala will start to cool off a little bit. And now I'm not talking when you're in the middle of a, you know, a dramatic circumstance, but I'm talking about the normal everyday kind of experience. But what usually happens is we get triggered and then we get triggered by getting triggered. And then, you know, and, and, it, and it keeps, we keep re-triggering ourselves um, until at some point it's just taken over our whole system. And if we were actually to stop and say, okay, I notice anger is present right now. I notice I'm having a reaction right now. Um, let me just take a breath for a minute. And this is where, you know, I've been teaching meditation for 20 years, which has really helped me in this regard. Um, now I can slow my system down. Now let me look again at this circumstance. All right, they said something. I know I got triggered by it, but was it really them or was it something else? I remember um, a number of years ago, my wife Leslie and I were in the kitchen one morning and she says, honey, can you take out the trash? And I noticed I had this reaction, like I got annoyed with her. 
Now, I don't mind taking out the trash. So it was going, well, I realized at that moment she had become my mom and I'd become a seven-year-old and my mom and I used to have these righteous battles about taking out the trash because my mom always would have taken out now, right? Yeah. And I would always say, mom, I'll get to it, you know? So at that moment, for some reason, the way she said it, maybe it was the tone of her voice, the mood I was in, whatever it was, I had slipped into that seven-year-old reaction. And when I stopped for a second and noticed, because like, where's this reaction coming from? When I stopped to turn that flashlight on myself, I laughed out loud. And I said to her, no problem, mom, I'll do it in a moment. And she looked, because we do this work together, as you know, we're business partners. We, she laughed and she's done the same thing with me when I've acted in ways that triggered her father reaction. So the more we can, we can have a sense of humor about this with ourselves and be more aware of the fact that we really are um, uh, as I said, more, more rationalizing than rational. Um, we, we're spending, we spend a lot of time worrying about how we make robots act more like human beings, but we should really spend more time looking at how we can make human beings act less like robots. Absolutely. You know, I've had that experience recently when I started graduate school um, and I had work, uh, you know, assignments to, you know, to do. I would get so stressed out. And, yeah. and what's funny is that when I was in college, I didn't get stressed out. And I noticed that it was because I haven't been to school for decades, but I've had decades of, I'm using the wrong word, but horrible bosses, right? Or that pressure to get something done. And I was looking at my teacher as my boss and they were the absolute opposite. They would completely work with me. They would answer any question I have. You know, they, they were like my friend. They wanted me to succeed. And I was like getting all backed up. And when I saw that, it kind of released it. And I was able to, just do the work and not have the overlay of that of that interpretation uh, that became that stressed me out. Yeah, for sure. And uh, you know, when it comes up, I'm like, oh, that's not what's really going on. That's not at all what's going on. That's just some back then it happened. And well, well, I really feel like we talked for a long time, but I feel like yeah. if we keep talking, it's going to just drag on and on. But I want to thank you, Howard, for doing the work that you do and oh, taking a pleasure. stand for social justice. I think, you know, the thing about social justice that people don't understand is that it's not just for a certain kind of people, it's for all people. You know, when we made this world better, we make it better for everyone. It doesn't exclude anyone. And uh, thank you so much. I look forward to getting, to getting your signature on my book. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> Go to Amazon by Everyday Bias Now. Don't wait. Don't let your biases get in the way of buying the book. Yeah, Lauren, thank you so much. I so appreciate it. And you, um, you know, it's funny, you were talking about the you know, bookmarked and earmarked and you know, all those kinds of things. You know, I've had people come up to me at conferences and apologize because they've got, you know, dog ears and marked. But I tell you, to an author, there's no, nothing makes my heart sing more to know that the book's been used in that way. And I particularly want to acknowledge, I know you've taken the work out into the world and made a real difference with people. So thank you so much for that. And I appreciate yeah. our friendship as well. Yeah, same, man. All right, well, take it easy. Thanks for watching. Feel free to comment below. You can like and share this video with all of your friends. Um, yeah, it's good stuff. Thanks. Thank you.